Hello everybody, uh, David here. Uh, this is the new episode of TMM Season 0, Episode 4. And I'm here with Yasu Matthew, the mister of all the knowledge when it comes to technology. He can tell you every piece of history of any chip that was made since the beginning of time. Welcome, uh, Matthew. <laughs> Awesome! Thank you, David. And yeah, welcome to our new episode uh, number four of the Technological Mind Mel. Thank you very much, David, for pulling it all together. And uh, you're welcome. We're using this new platform, so we've got sound effects. I love that. So yes, David, exactly. remind me again. We were going to talk about. Um, um, yeah, today we're going to talk all about you and all about your business uh, because uh, I think I want to know more about it and I think it's worth um, getting a, a better understanding of what you do because we always talk uh, anecdotally about uh, um, your company here and there and I think it would be nice to um, yeah. go into detail, especially after me seeing your interview with, can you remind me with whom did you have? Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, um, um, there was this cool video. Uh, actually, we recorded it probably about a month ago, but I, I did an interview with a gentleman called Jeff Gerling, who mm. has a really cool YouTube channel. And uh, Jeff is kind of like the key expert and influencer on Raspberry Pi technology. So everyone goes and watches his content on YouTube to get the latest news and to get all sorts of tips and tricks. So um, Jeff and I ended up being introduced actually by Michael Kelly from pi to design Michael Kelly mm. and I have been working together since 2011. And uh, Michael is this really awesome electronic designer and um, has been working in electronics for uh, over 40 years, actually, uh, since he was a student and um, uh, has actually worked in his previous career for some pretty big name um, computer manufacturers and other electronic um, um, you know, uh, uh, players in the, in the market in, in the United States. Um, but yeah, so Michael and I, uh, Michael Kelly and I, uh, worked on uh, the original um, Field Cloud product and uh, contracted mm. um, uh, Michael in to design what became the NS Box, which was the first hardware product that Field Cloud launched exactly 10 years ago. In fact, oh, wow. um, uh, I, had a, I had a social media facebook reminder yesterday say saying hey on this day 10 years ago and sure enough it was the day that i assembled the very first two complete units of the product um and so that was our very first um uh, actual field cloud product uh -huh. for edge computing for industrial edge computing and then fast forward a decade and uh, michael and i have been working on um the uh, next generation gateway, which was the topic of conversation with Jeff. Um, yeah, that's what I saw, and I was a little bit took by surprise because I mean we know each other very very sh for a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. We basically have these chats every two weeks, and that's basically uh, how we get to know each other. After the after the recordings, we keep talking most of the time. Um, so yeah, we are still fresh uh, with this with this friendship, remote friendship, and, uh, mm. and yeah, it'd be nice to. And that's why I got curious about after this interview. We're like, wait a moment. I think um, Matthew here has some uh, some cool stuff uh, that is pretty unique and not standard. Uh, in the so, I feel quite flattered. I know David, you've got cool stuff as well, and we'll definitely have I a chance to talk about that on your stuff has the word explosion in it. So I think you win this one. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So anyway, so let, let's just kind of rewind a bit. And before I talk about me or Field Cloud and what we do, mm -hmm. maybe we could just take a moment to kind of look at what uh, our customers are looking for and what the market requires or the market is in, is in need of. So if you look at the 
sort of industrial space out there, you have a range of industrial activities which are always involved in making things, producing mm -hmm. stuff, producing uh, raw materials, producing finished goods. There's a continuum. And in the same way, you also have a continuum of um, very, let's say, kind of safe or very uh, low risk manufacturing through to very mm -hmm. high risk manufacturing or high risk production. And so the kinds of things that Phil Cloud work on are very much linked to higher risk or high risk activities. Um, and that really just came about because of the kinds of industries I worked in before Phil Cloud. I spent 13 years of my career working in the oil and gas industry. And obviously oil and gas and anything to do with energy um, uh, requires a lot of careful risk management and all sorts of um, uh, you know, protection of equipment so that we don't blow up half the planet or kill lots of people. And so ultimately... And you were, sorry that I interrupted, but you were like in IT at that time working for those companies? Second. Were you working in, in, in the IT sector for those companies? Yeah, um, but also on product development later on. So yeah, okay. I just kind of like spent you know, 13 years of my life that was spent working for one company. Um, I started in the field. I was very much focused on more technical IT and then on communications infrastructure. Mm. I kind of, that changed in for about yeah, it was almost seven years I was working in corporate IT, looking after global infrastructure. And then the last few years of my time with this company, I was working on product development. And this wasn't IT general purpose, you know, systems. It was very specific and actually was a foundation for what ended up becoming Field Cloud's core line of business. Mm -hmm. So that's actually uh, interesting. So why um, why a company like that that we were working for um, decide like why why a company like what a, like let's say any energy company why would they prefer to find outside companies that provide a solution instead of doing it themselves? Well, that's a great question because I think. Over the course of the last, uh, you know, few decades, you know, um, um, perhaps even the last 50 years, if we think about it, there's definitely been a pendulum that swung between doing things in-house to doing things, uh, you know, with third parties. Um, a great case in point is actually my former uh, employer, the company I worked for for 13 years in... Um, uh, I've got to get my timeline right, but it was around the late 70s. Um, mm -hmm. They actually purchased a semiconductor company and got involved oh, wow. in electronic components. And it was simply because uh, they wanted to internalize a lot of the technology building blocks to get a competitive advantage for building very specialized systems that were for measurement and for obviously measuring very specific parameters uh, for characterizing um, and again without using fancy language we talk about the subsurface of things that happen underground in the oil uh, and gas environment so we typically will drill into the ground and we'll pull oil and gas from out from from, from, from underneath the, the surface right, right. That's what yeah. the things that happen underground and so the subsurface characterization is very important. And uh, that requires obviously very high temperature electronics. It requires oh, okay. electronics that work with very high pressure as well. And so being able to influence the development of those kind of components is quite important. The mm -hmm. question is though, is do you need to own a semiconductor company uh, to be able to design your specific components? Um, and if we look at how the pendulum has swung backwards and forwards, over the last 50 years, um, we've had successive waves of doing things with external third party partners through doing things in house. And I think this pendulum is going to continue swinging in the foreseeable future. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, sometimes 
you'll want to do things to get a very clear competitive advantage. Um, and there are ways of doing open innovation today or doing collaborative innovation, collaborative research and development, where mm -hmm. you can create a consortium of different third parties. And I think the key part to this is knowing what is the value chain and who does what, where, and is it important for it to be internal or is it important to rather build critical mass outside, right? Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's going to be this case, it's pendulum continually swinging. Right. And so, so because of that, you started specializing in, in creating hardware that can run in remote and dangerous environments, right? Um, so can you tell me about the latest product that you have, which is, in my opinion, the coolest one, because mm. it basically it's a device that is explosion proof, uh, especially that is the interesting. The curious thing is explosion proof from the inside. Right, it's not resistant from an explosion of the outside, because for whatever reason you care more about what's happening in the box, not what's happening outside the box. Well, I tell you what, if you have an explosion on the outside, you're much. <laughs> you don't care about the box anymore. You're, you're much bigger problems. Yeah, and exactly. That's the last thing okay. you're going to care about is the box. Um, but in a um, environment where there are flammable gases or flammable dust. Mm -hmm. So there are two main categories which require explosion protection or protection against um, uh, you know, some kind of ignition. In, and, and so it's either gas or dust, okay? Dust mm -hmm. is found in mining, so mm -hmm. coal dust. It's found in flour mills, so food right. processing, so where you are making flour for bread, you're grinding up wheat. It's found in the surprising farm. one when I heard for the first time that what flour can, can ignite. Yes. Like, yeah, this. yes. Very fine particles of flour, right, um, present a real hazard um, mm -hmm. uh, because all you need is just a one spark and you can ignite an entire, you know, cloud of uh, dust and cause a major explosion. So, yeah, it's true that some flour mills have blown up because the dust has ignited. So that's flour. The, the third example is in the pharmaceutical industry where you are, again, mixing powders to make drugs. Huh. Okay. Okay. Um, and farm, farm is quite, quite peculiar because you will also find some places where there are gases as well. Um, I would say that in um, some other industries that work with dry powders, uh, and there are numerous examples of other industry verticals that work with um, your very finely ground, you know, you know, powder. Um, um, mm -hmm. So you'll find it, for example, in manufacturing paint. Uh, before okay. you start mixing paint, um, right. you end up with certain types of um, um, uh, you know, raw materials that need to be ground right. into powder form. So mm -hmm. there's that. Uh, then on gas, uh, well, gas kind of like ranges from uh, the usual suspects, which is in hydrocarbon type, uh, you know, environments where, you know, I'm drilling for oil, I'm producing oil, I'm producing gas. Um, I'm, for example, refining oil or refining gas and processing it. I'm transporting gas or I'm distributing gas. And so, these kinds of environments are pretty well known. Um, in fact, if you were to look at a gas station where you fill your car with petrol or diesel, you will notice some symbols on the yeah. pump, on the gas pump, because that gas pump is certified, compliant, and complies with a directive, particularly here in Europe, um, uh, which is called ATEX, A-T-E-X. ATEX stands for Atmosphere Explosive. Okay. All right. And this is a European directive that basically sets some rules on how you protect equipment from accidental explosion, accidental mm -hmm. risk of ignition. Anyway, so yeah, bottom line is, is that any, um, let's say, device or piece of equipment, um, the term that we normally use is apparatus, okay, so any apparatus that um, um, has some electrical signal, mm -hmm. be it 
low voltage or high voltage, uh, it doesn't matter, right? But any electrical signal, there is a risk that you may have a spark and mm -hmm. any spark is an ignition source. Okay, so those are examples for electrical. You also have mechanical um, production of sparks. So think about um, uh, right. friction. Mm -hmm. So I've got something that rotates. So I've got something that basically grinds up against uh, you know, another piece and it mm -hmm. rotates. You may end up with sparks. So you've got to limit the risk of ignition from these sparks. And so how does your product, the main product does that? Is the, does it have a special box? Yeah. Special connections? Like what's, how, 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 what is it? So, so both. So there's a range of different um, standards or different um, uh, techniques that can be used to, again, protect a, um, let's say, some facility from accidental explosion. And uh, the particular protection scheme that we work with, because it turned out that this was actually the fastest way to bring a product to market mm -hmm. and uh, deliver value for our customers, uh, mm -hmm. was to uh, make something which is known as um, flame proof. Okay. Okay. And what this uh, scheme it uses is a particular type of box which is quite heavy okay. and um, again when combined with the right let's say cable entries mm -hmm. we call these glands so a cable gland uh, okay. we're able to again produce an explosion proof apparatus mm -hmm. now it's quite and simple if there's an extra right yeah but when you say like if you know, what i'm thinking when, when i when i think about a box that is screwed right so it's closed it's sealed does it mean that let's say you put it in an environment when there is gas will this gas leak slowly over over the years inside the box and that would, could cause the explosion it's not the gas that causes the explosion so much as the spark which causes the explosion okay oh okay so you're preventing any sparks to to to, to get in touch with the atmosphere to get in touch with the outside atmosphere okay. right so okay. anyway just to kind of go through the very basics in layman's terms right so the enclosure has a particular um, um let's say um lid or cover uh -huh. okay and again there's a couple of different well-known designs which uh again offer this type of protection but one thing that they all have in common is that uh you have basically a lid and you screw the lid on okay mm -hmm. and there is a certain amount of thread okay so the mm -hmm. thread is basically you know if i've got a screw and a, and a bolt or a nut right and i'm going to be putting a, a bolt and nut together I've got a thread okay mm -hmm. and um there's enough thread enough turns of the thread right which allows any gas that might um, um come through or uh, it's, it's not so much the gas that comes in it's more about what goes out so if mm -hmm. i have an explosion inside the enclosure and even if i have flammable gas present okay mm -hmm right it's going to cause an explosion inside and there's going to be a release of energy right mm -hmm. and so that energy releases pressure and also uh, increases the temperature and what happens is is that that energy has to escape somehow okay mm -hmm. and what it's going to do is it's going to literally go through the thread of that cover that's screwed on mm -hmm. And as it goes out, because that's the only way it's actually going to be able to escape. And as it starts going round and round through the thread, it will slow down and cool. So the pressure is mm -hmm. going to be lowered and the um, uh, temperature is going to be lowered. So basically, by the time that energy, right, or that, 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 that combustion, it, it comes out, it's going to be 
lower than the threshold to actually ignite the air outside. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. And, that's and so what about those, you call them, uh, there's a technical name, like those connection, like those prongs that allows you to interface with the outside world. Um, so I'm assuming uh, they're also designed in a way that is special, uh, yeah. that does not allow um, any sparks uh, to happen. And can you yeah. tell a little bit about how, how were they designed? Because there are, I'm going to try to attach a photo of, of, your, of, your, of your box, of your product uh, in the edit. But they're quite big, right? And and so what's so special about them? Like why do they have, because they're so big, because they have so many layers be, before um, you enter inside and outside or what's happening in those things? So, yeah, let me just answer it specifically with the Milu X explosion proof gateway system that we make. Mm -hmm. So we have some cable entries or um, again, these are cable glands mm -hmm. we have obviously a power supply so we're bringing in 24 volt dc in through one of the cable entries we have mm -hmm. antennas okay and we've got antenna cables that need to mm -hmm. come out of the gateway and go to an antenna array we have four right. antennas mm -hmm. um so those five cables so dc power plus four antennas those are protected using an explosion proof cable gland mm -hmm. and what an explosion proof cable gland has is it also has again a the, the right kind of thread okay but it also has a rubber um, stopper or a rubber seal mm -hmm. and you put the cable through the rubber and then it's, it's what we call a compression seal you basically are fastening the um, uh, the, uh, the outside of the cable gland and it compresses okay. the rubber against the cable. Wow. Okay. And so that basically then reduces the uh, risk of gas going in or coming out. Mm -hmm. But then there's another technique that we also have to employ is that that's not enough. So you, you've got the rubber compression seal on the, let's say on the outside, but then on mm -hmm. the inside of the enclosure, we actually have to pour epoxy resin. So, or what we call potting compound. Mm -hmm. So there's a particular type of resin that we basically inject into the um, inner part of the cable gland, and that forms a poured, what we call a poured seal, okay? Mm -hmm. So every time it's, uh, you mount it, once you screw it, you have, have, you have the, extra strap, the extra step that you have to pour um, yeah. this, to, to close it up, okay? Correct, right. correct, correct. And so... so uh, and, and, and do you, uh, um, when it comes to the case and uh, those glands, uh, are those things out of off the shelves things or you make them yourself? Um, can you talk about a little bit of that part? No, there's a very wide variety of cable glands that are on the market that are certified for um, hazardous areas and mm -hmm. depending on what protection scheme or you're using, uh and what type of cable you're using as well so i haven't gone into detail about the types of cables you'll find in the field but some of the um let's say higher voltage higher current power cables mm -hmm. um, or cables that are required to be used in very uh, let's say hostile environments where mm -hmm. there's a risk of mechanical um, um, uh, damage Mm -hmm. uh, will tend to have what, uh, a, an armored sheath or some kind of like um, uh, other mechanical protection. Mm -hmm. And so you'll end up with cable glands that have got, uh, again, two seals, uh, one for the inner part of the cable and the one for the outer part of the cable. Yeah, so there's, there, are, there, there are like specialized companies that uh, yes. Know how to build it, these, yes. these devices yes. to make yes. sure yes. that when they, when they sell you this thing, it's tested. It's, it's like it's guaranteed to work. Right? Yeah. The hardest part is knowing what to specify, right, or what to choose mm -hmm. for the particular application. Um, you know, and uh, we've had examples. I mean, I can talk about a particular customer that, uh, again, 
uh, had equipment that was built by a third party and they actually specified a very robust um, cable and mm -hmm. protection system. However, it was inappropriate for the application. Oh. It was inappropriate because it was actually, um, uh, again, the length of the cable and its rigidity were not appropriate for that particular application. So the type of mechanical strength, it's not a tougher cable or a more robust cable isn't necessarily the right choice depending on your application. So knowing right. what type of cable to select, or what type of cable gland to select. The other thing to also bear in mind is that uh, once you've poured that seal in, mm -hmm. that's it. If you need to remove it, you're going to have to literally throw the whole thing away right the, oh, the, wow. okay. yeah so it's a one-time thing you can't recover you can't kind of somehow cut out the the, the resin right and re right. i mean you have to cut out the cable and maybe if the cable is long enough re redo it but even then it's kind of yeah this is the, the, the this is a real issue right when it comes to field wiring and uh, mm. being able to again maintain a system over time because if you do need to for example replace equipment uh you have to be very careful on um, um you know again uh do you have enough spare cable or do you have to rerun cable the longer the cable run the more expensive it is for installation cost yeah. not to mention the fact that sometimes these cables are uh cost you know i don't know i mean uh, you know hundreds of euros per meter right wow okay uh, but so once you put the case and the, the uh, uh, keep uh, keep wanting to call them props for whatever reason uh, those connectors, uh, mm -hmm. is there extra testing uh, testing involved? Meaning, is there like a final test to make sure that everything is, is sealed correctly yeah. and still yeah. okay? Yeah. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Um, there's one thing I did want to mention, which had to do with the other types of uh, fittings that we use on the. Milu X system. So we've got cable glands for antennas and power, but we also have two important uh, devices which are called couplers. And these are these long protruding, um, you know, uh, uh, pieces of, you know, of, of machined metal, right? Mm -hmm. The things you were referring to. So the these couplers are, um, uh, are a little bit more sophisticated than a cable gland. Um, they incorporate protection circuitry inside the coupler itself. Okay. Oh, okay. And one of the big advantages of using that, even though the actual article is quite expensive, is that it allows you to simplify the wiring and oh, also okay. allows you to uh, disconnect or reconnect cables in the field. Oh, wow. Okay. So it brings a big plus on being able to move cables around or repair cables or replace cables without impacting the integrity of the enclosure. And there's definitely, um, I think, a, a good and a very clear saving over time if you use this type of coupler. Right? And uh, you being Italian would be very proud to know that that's made by an Italian company called Solexi Wireless. Yeah. Yay! Italy does something else than just wine and cheese. Do you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. So you were also mentioning uh, before that you have four antennas that come out of, yes. your, of, of, your, of your product. Why so many antennas? Like, what do you have? You have Wi-Fi, you have GSM, Bluetooth, maybe? No. What else do you have? No? That's not if how it works? No. So there's two antennas for LTE, for, uh, for cellular, and there's two antennas mm -hmm. for Wi-Fi. And why are there two? Because we yeah. use a technology called MIMO, M-I-M-O, multiple in, multiple out. And mm -hmm. MIMO is the way that we improve reliability and range for wireless communication today. Mm -hmm. So the reason why 4G LTE communication is pretty damn good is because mm -hmm that radio communication for cellular networks uses MIMO, right? The reason why we ended up with all sorts of coverage issues at the old days of GS, the first GSM network is that that was using a single antenna and 
if you were a little bit far away or kind of um, behind a building or behind trees or whatever, your um, um, signal quality would be less. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know a little bit about what MIMO is, right, this multiple in, multiple out, basically, if you think about radio propagation, if I'm sending a signal, if I'm transmitting a signal and I'm expecting someone to receive the signal, that signal is going to be radiated out from my antenna, kind of like in a straight line, and a lot of straight lines, depending on the geometry of the antenna. If I've got an omnidirectional antenna, I'm going to be radiating out 360 degrees from my antenna. Yeah. Not all the signal is going to, again, go from the transmission antenna to the receiving antenna. Mm -hmm. Because if I've got buildings or obstacles or you know, a hill or people in between the, in my signal path, yep. some of that signal is going to bounce off the obstacle and come back. Okay, yeah. All right, and depending on where you are and what kinds of obstacles you have, signals are going to reflect in, in multiple places. And what that does is that that slows down the signal a bit. And so it will arrive later than when your clear signal arrives at the receiving end. Right. So what does that mean? If something is delayed, it means it's going to arrive out of phase. Oh, okay. So that's how physics, you know, that's how wave propagation yeah. works in physics. So I'm going to have part of my signal arriving out of phase. And when it arrives out of phase, it's going to cancel out part of the signal. Mm. It's going to attenuate the total signal. So that's not good. So that's why inside a building in the old days, right, you had really crappy mobile coverage inside a building. Okay. And you would very often have to install equipment inside like a nano cell or a pico cell or even a femto cell, right? In order to provide coverage inside the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what MIMO does differently is MIMO, all right, compensates because I've got more than one transmission and I've got more than one reception. And so what we end up doing with some of the clever electronics in the radio part of the circuit Mm -hmm. is we're able to again reconstruct and compensate for signals arriving out of phase mm. so you can deal with much lower signal strength much 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 mm. worse you know noise in the environment and this right. is but you have to be position the antennas in, in, they cannot be close together they have to be apart relatively no they shouldn't be too no. far apart and if you think about it, your phone to mm -hmm. that, right? The regular phone actually right. has, two, has two antennas inside for your, Got for your mobile phone. So it doesn't have to be super apart uh, to yeah. figure out. Uh, okay, interesting. Uh, okay. And so, but yeah. And, and, and by the way, you can see behind you, can see where I'm sitting. There's there's an antenna yeah. array right there or above my phone. Oh. I thought it's like a gun anti aircraft gun, but no, it's just something. No, that's an explosion proof antenna array, right? The shorter, fatter antennas on each end are the Wi Fi yeah. ones, and the ones in the middle are the cellular 4G antennas. Wow, serious business. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so you basically, uh, your product you're offering is a not only a case, but also the hardware inside. So you provide basically a platform for your customers yeah. to run uh, their own custom software, right? Yeah, um, very much so, yes. Okay, so if I want to have a explosion-proof device that can communicate remotely with my equipment, I come to you, you provide this awesome case with custom electronics inside, yeah. and and then I'm allowed to put whatever I want inside and then it's off, uh, off the races. And what type of, 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 of electronic do, do, do you, you, you spoke already about Wi-Fi and LTE, right? What else is, is inside? Like what else do we get um, uh, in this product package? Well, if you want to talk about like hardware specifications, so it is built around the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 
So mm -hmm. what makes this interesting as a platform is that you can effectively leverage the really cool ecosystem and community for Raspberry Pi, um, you know, software operating system and hardware. So if you want to do something very, let's say basic mm -hmm. and reuse, you know, the uh, base operating system that runs the you know, on a regular Raspberry Pi and use that in an explosion proof environment, you could, right? Mm -hmm. We do things a little bit differently. So we'll actually, um, as, as, as one option, we'll use a very minimalist, very small footprint Debian uh, operating system, 64 bit ARM, so ARM 64. So it's a custom, custom the distribution that you make. No, it's not a custom distribution. It actually is standard Debian. It's just it's 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 probably the lightest or most the the one of the oh. let's say it's minimal. It's minimal, right? So if you but, do but it's one of those uh, publicly available open open project that is just the bare minimum to just to run everything. That you need. It's not something that you did. It, uh, you, you didn't compile the, the the kernel by yourself. You didn't put uh, change the packaging. What type of packages are inside? It's just a distribution. There's a couple. There. Of, there's a couple of. Uh, there's a couple of specifics. So yes, there is a um, specifically compiled kernel, okay. uh, which includes a few configurations which enable hardware which is not normally enabled by default for a standard Raspberry Pi. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. And again, if you want me to go into the technical details, why? So the base product, the, the, the board that we designed, uh, that Michael and I, uh, uh, Michael Kelly and I designed, is the, uh, it includes a trusted platform module, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which basically is a uh, crypto chip for securing um the boot process and for and for providing some cryptographic operations that you would use for securing things in the operating system and things even in your application stack mm, okay okay so again without going into gory details about what a tpm is um a good example is when microsoft released windows 11 one of the conditions that they placed is you could only upgrade or install Windows 11 on a PC that had at least a TPM 2.0 chip on the motherboard. So the Raspberry Pi by default doesn't have this. No. And you in your board, you added this extra feature uh, for the clients. That Correct. Because that's important enough, right, in order to provide a... Um, so... There's the whole thing of being able to attest or have an attestation that what I am booting, what kernel I'm booting, actually, even before you fire up the kernel, you want to make sure is my bootloader what I'm expecting to load, okay? Mm -hmm. Is my um, uh, kernel expecting what I, what, what, I, what I want to load? Is my operating system and my, multi, my user space, is it what I'm expecting, right? And if those signatures don't match right the checksums that are cryptographically um, uh, um, signed if they don't match then it will refuse to go to the next step in the boot process mm -hmm. so it's and a way to again ensure that the system is tamper proof or at right. least more or less tamper proof because there are ways around this okay if you have physical access to the hardware Mm -hmm. Then, again, you could reinstall everything and start from a clean slate. But you lose two things, right? First is you lose whatever's running on the system. Mm -hmm. All right. So literally, you've got you 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 literally are going to completely reinstall, right? You don't mm -hmm. have access to the to the good configuration. So you're talking if someone maliciously had access, physical access to the device. Yeah. And but physical control. access, malicious, malicious physical access. Yeah. And so yeah. the second one is, yeah, I mean, you have to pull it out of a hazardous environment. Mm -hmm. And so then find the bullet proof case, right? Exactly. Like you have to get it out and then somehow take it out and put on, <laughs> you know, and then access like, you know, put, put wires on and, and, and connect to, 
you know, again, there's always a way that you can do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's nothing that is completely infallible with security if you have physical access and can get to the low level components. But at least even in this case, you have access to it, you will lose all the uh, data and everything that was yeah. uh, on the For device. Sure. And so right. your, your, your IP, uh, private IP, like your IP, like when uh, yes. uh, intellectual property would be saved and preserved. And to be honest, our IP is a lot less. Well, I mean, it's important, but it's a lot less important than our customers, right? So no, I, I'm talking about the customers. I think, right? Where, you know, the customer is doing something that gives them a competitive advantage. We want to absolutely make sure that you, the customer, are protected and that we can assure, right, that yeah. you're not going to have something bad happen. Now, look, in the world of the cloud and the world of being able to manage workload, that's, that's a whole other topic of conversation, which I think you are going to ask later in this conversation, right? About how we're going to do the network. To. Part? Yeah. If I decide to. I'm yeah, sure. absolutely. But I, I, again, to finish up on the electronics, right? So, you know, so there's, so there's memory, there's compute, and then there's also storage. And one thing that you know, we believed is a game changer is that we're a, we've included NVMe storage on the on the board so this is solid state so ssd so solid state storage and it is much faster even though the raspberry pi compute module 4 doesn't have anywhere near the speed on its pci express bus compared to some server class you know the kinds of things you'll find in the data center it still mm -hmm. is light years beyond some of the embedded systems that we would find you know in these harsh environments so we're able to very affordably for our customers in a very capital efficient way offer really fast storage for doing certain types of workloads so this is a, this is really important when you want to run for example a time series database mm, let's say you okay. want to ingest data in the field and you would like to be able to normalize that and timestamp everything and record data locally so that you can do some um, processing, for example, apply some algorithms, do some stream processing mm -hmm. in the field, and then only send summarized data into the cloud. You can right. do that, right? Okay, got it. And uh, one, another question would be like, why did you choose, like you explained why you chose the Raspberry Pi uh but why like, yes you get uh, access to the community like first of all when i hear raspberry pi i hear hobby project mm -hmm. and you are a very serious project uh, since like you know it's, it's being placed put in place in very serious environments so yeah. is it a childish you know side project my i'm doing on a weekend like because yeah. again i hear raspberry pi i hear hobbyists and you're using it in a, such a serious environment. So Why did you great, make this? It's a great question. It's a great question. So I'll say this. So the Raspberry Pi really. Or that, can I can I can I rephrase my question? Why yeah. don't you create a board with the CPU already built in, not as custom to you, and just give that away? Yeah, that's how we did it back in the day, right? Before mm -hmm. the Raspberry Pi hit the market. Oh, okay. In fact, the Raspberry Pi, when it came out a decade ago, really threw the entire embedded computing world on its head, okay? Because before then, the market was very fragmented and the cost to develop, right, the investment that was required to develop the board from scratch and not only to do the electronics, but to also do the Linux kernel to bring up an operating system mm -hmm. to leverage what is, what, 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 is, what is still known, actually, if you talk to old timers in the, in the industry, they'll talk about a BSP or board support package. Board support package, typically the manufacturer provides kernel, provides some so software development kit, some kind of minimalist operating system. And you mm -hmm. literally have to take the BSP and then build your target environment. So you ended up with these very monolithic 
these products, right? These products which ended up tying up a lot of engineering resources before you actually hit the market. Mm-hmm. And I think what made the Raspberry Pi so exciting was that number one, it, it was originally designed as a le- learning tool. But I do think the market has shifted a lot in the last 10 years. There's definitely an educational aspect to it. There's now a critical mass and a sense of maturity in the community. So it's really provided a very large pool of competencies and also competencies that like to share knowledge. So if you look at Jeff Gerling's YouTube channel Mm -hmm. and you also look at some of the other resources that are published out there, there is such a wealth of knowledge that is shared that actually has allowed things to be standardized. And when they standardized, okay, you can leverage that standardization. So it's it's cheaper to develop because then you get you have a pool of developers that know the platform yes there's a standardized kernel there's the drivers for everything etc 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 exactly exactly but one of the things that you know uh, people like myself and other players in the industrial computing space Mm -hmm. one of the things that we were all saying to raspberry pi to the pi foundation and this was going back you know ever since the beginning was like hey this board is cool, however, it's not fit for purpose for industrial designs, okay? Mm-hmm. And there was a couple of reasons, right? One is, hey, um, you know, we would prefer to, again, eliminate certain connectors because these connectors are not safe in an industrial environment. I see. Because they're, they wear out, so mm-hmm. they'll break or the, there's risks of sparks or um, the power supply. So using a five volt you know, micro USB to power your Raspberry Pi is fine at home, mm-hmm. but it's not acceptable in an industrial, in a factory, right? A factory, oh, okay. the nominal you know, power supply is 24 volts DC. So you need mm-hmm. to be able to, again, use a 24 volt DC power input. Okay, so that means extra hardware. Um, There's a certain tolerance that's required in an industrial environment, particularly in environments where I'm working off solar power. So solar power, I'm going to vary quite, it depends if I'm charging or if I'm not charging. So I need to have a much wider input voltage. So again, if you look at the hardware that we build, and that we've been building since the beginning, We've always designed it so that we can accommodate these kinds of noisy, wide, variable power inputs. Um, And, um, you know, actually the kind of stuff we have on this gateway can work from like 10 volts to like 36 volts input. And so it covers a couple of different scenarios that you find in the industrial space. The Raspberry Pi can't do that. Mm -hmm. So it's only the compute module has these extra features. No, I'm talking about the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi compute module provides a pluggable, yeah. you know, module that then yeah. go, goes on to your own custom or your own specific electronic circuit board. And so yeah. this whole module concept is very interesting and it actually was... Um, but it's also like it lacks all the extra fluff that, that the regular Raspberry Pi has that you just don't need, right? Yeah, no, well, it eliminates all of the peripheral hardware that you would find on a regular Pi that right. consumers will find useful. And right, but in, in your case, gives, it's not needed for... Well, it yeah. gives the designer, the product designer, the freedom to choose to implement um, mm-hmm. certain peripherals um, or not. So, right. like on our boards, our boards are all he- headless. They don't have a HDMI output you can't plug in a flat screen monitor into uh you know what we make and that's Mm -hmm. by design we chose not to implement hdmi because Mm -hmm. we're not going to be uh installing this where you need a screen right okay um but what we had to design is we had to design in for example um, um so pci express switch 
components to extend the PCI Express bus mm -hmm. to accommodate multiple PCI Express peripherals because mm -hmm. we've got dual NVMe um, uh, drives. Uh, we provide PCI Express for, um, uh, let's say, higher um, power Wi-Fi uh, mm -hmm. modules. We have PCI Express for additional Ethernet ports because the board has got three Ethernets on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it for redundancy? No, it's for security and for, again, uh, topology. So oh, okay. in some industrial environments, you may want to have multiple LAN segments, depending on how you want to secure or segment your network. Oh, OK. So this just is a, is, is a, it allows for segmentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to segment further, we can also implement VLANs and um, uh, various other um, techniques to further segment virtually. Um, mm -hmm. But what you typically find in a factory environment is that you'll find certain classes of um, instruments on one segment and then um, maintenance on another segment where okay. it may require, uh, for example, engineering access. So in, 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 right, in, so in, special in, privilege just to access that network to... Function. Yeah, so when we talk about engineering access, um, uh, you know, you would typically have um, you know, a field engineer or a service engineer uh, accessing via this network segment so that they can program uh, some of the instruments that exist. So, yeah, I mean, anyway, there are multiple ways of doing it, but yeah, having three Ethernets definitely helps. Okay, so I want to ask uh, the last question because we're coming close to the one hour mark. Uh, yeah. So, how is the maintenance performed? Who, who does it? Like, after you deploy this, who? Mm. What's the great... like everything is working deployed and something happens uh, uh, the device needs to be replaced or whatever it's a, it's a great it's a great que it's a great question and um, there are multiple ways that um, you know maintenance responsibilities can be allocated right so it, it can range from uh, you know complete in-house customer takes all responsibility and then buys spare systems or uh, again has access to purchasing you know spare hardware so that's one scenario so basically they'll keep a pool of, 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 of hardware or we'll go through a classic RMA process return merchandise authorization right which is um, um, a very classic way of dealing with um, you know, again, uh, replacement hardware um, shipment. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we don't keep spares in-house. However, we maintain in-house. And then mm -hmm. we'll basically go to the manufacturer with an RMA and open up an RMA and then get replacement hardware. So that's one extreme is it's in-house. Mm -hmm. The other extreme is it's a complete managed service. Okay. All right. And so the managed service gets quite interesting because that means that Phil Cloud is responsible for, again, not just the, um, let's say, sort of the, the, the regular uh, system operations, mm -hmm. but also then hardware maintenance. So if something breaks, you know, we'll replace it, we'll go to site, we'll fix it, we'll, re we'll, we'll swap out mm -hmm. a faulty unit, um, or uh, again, in between, there's a couple of other options where, for example, there could be a spares inventory held on site, mm -hmm. uh, local um, you know, maintenance tech would be responsible for swapping out a piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. And then Phil Cloud would be responsible for some of the remote access and uh, bringing things back online or restoring workload. Mm -hmm. Or it might be with the customer. So there's, there are multiple ways to do it. And honestly, we're very open, and I think depending on what kind of um, use case mm -hmm. you have as a customer, right. you may require a hybrid or you may require one extreme or the other extreme. So, again, the choice really is yours. Right, so it's depend on the customer and what are his needs. Yeah, very, 
Very, very much so, very much so. One, one thing I can say from experience, though, is that when we do build a um, solution that's brand new, um, we typically, and again, it's something that customers often ask for, then we're very happy to provide it, and we're, we're good at doing this, is to provide what's called hyper care. So hyper care is a more intensive support that is done in the initial kind of um, proof of uh, proof of concept, proof of value, minimal viable product, and then kind of field testing stages. And again, it all depends on what vocabulary you're comfortable with, what industry sector you're in. Sometimes you call this a proof of concept, sometimes you call it a pilot project, sometimes you call it a field test. Um, and uh, other times it'll just be known as a sort of a, 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 a pre, uh, let's say a pre-release or pre-deployment um, or a limited scale deployment. But very, very often the purpose of those kinds of deployments are done to collect feedback because the support model, the maintenance model can't be defined unless you build up this practice, right? Right. Makes sense because there's a lot of variables, there's a lot of uncertainty. And in a lot of these harsh environments, I mean, you really do have to uh, bring experts together. And again, we're very ha happy to be part of that expert pool or to facilitate experts inside the customer's organization or sometimes within their third party service mm -hmm. provider landscape to come together to actually monitor, evaluate, and then from those lessons learned, implement the right practices or the right procedures. Sometimes these, these procedures have to be written from scratch. Mm -hmm. Right, makes sense. Okay, yeah. so that's uh, kind of on the maintenance side, but I think when you were saying maintenance, you're probably talking about physical maintenance hardware. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. So then there's also the actual system operations and, um, uh, and, and, and also the networking part and the workload management part as well. So there's a whole series of layers, right, from the hardware all the way up to the, to the actual application workload. Right. Oh, I see. So you can also manage uh, the, the workload for the client. The client can manage on its own. Yeah. Uh, it all depends, uh, depends on the project. Yes. Uh, I yes. want to ask you one last last question, which I think we can close it to something more, something fun. What's the craziest place that you have your product installed in? The craziest place? Yes. Man. Mm. <laughs> on the moon? Do you have something on the moon? Not yet. No. I had. No. Um, I, I, the company I used to work for before Field Cloud actually had um, um, technology that they invented and developed that was both on the moon and on Mars. It's pretty okay. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Which had to, which had to do with um, um, various types of nuclear I I imaging or you know sensing oh, systems. Okay. Very 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 cool that. But anyway, I digress. Um, so, yeah, back in 2014, I had a really crazy project, um, which was for Canada. Okay. And uh, this is this is one of the crazier examples. Not not this. Uh, in fact, there's there's several that are crazy, but this is pretty crazy in the way in which the system was deployed using a hybrid methanol fuel cell and solar power system okay okay so the location is either very cold and the weather is really bad and there's hardly any sun mm -hmm. during winter okay minus 40 degrees centigrade Whoa. outside and in summer there's some sunshine but the ground thaws and it becomes a marshland and you can't actually get to the site. Oh, wow. So the only time you can actually visit the site for any maintenance visits is during winter where you can take a, 
the name is called a skidoo, but basically it's a snowmobile, right? And you uh -huh. literally can, uh, you literally ski out to, to, to the site wow. uh, to actually uh, interact with the hardware if you, need to, if you need to manage it. But during summer, forget it, right? There's absolutely okay. no way you'll, you'll, you'll get to that site. Mm -hmm. um, and so the challenge here is like, how do you provide power throughout the year knowing that um, if I um, can't use the sun, right? Right. I'm going to have to have some kind of fuel source. So yeah, so that for, for, for me, this was like one of the craziest like deployments was this thing that went into this hybrid fuel cell system. And wow, um, so you literally have the, a battery that runs on fuel for, for, for the winter times. So there was so there were batteries that were again providing backup power. The batteries were fed off either a solar charge um, uh, controller, so you had the solar panel, or yep. from a methanol fuel cell. So there's this basically wow. this tank or this bottle or you know it's a big can of, of, of methanol, right? So methylated spirits. And this thing would go into this fuel cell, burn the methanol, right? Yep. And generate electricity, and that's electricity would charge the battery and the battery would power the system. And so that was pretty wild. And the byproduct of that was that when the, so during winter, when it's minus 40, mm -hmm. okay, the um, methanol fuel cell would actually, it's, it's waste heat would serve to heat up the enclosure. Oh, okay. so, so even during, preventing the electronics from freezing from freezing yeah so we we, we were we, we were able to save on adding in a heater circuit which again consumes more electricity that's crazy that, that literally sound like sending space probe into space yep because that's the same problem like you have to heat like the mars rover they need to heat it up so yes the electronics don't freeze and start breaking yeah and crumbling. So it was pretty. It was pretty cool seeing that because the CPU temperature, right, of the gateway of the NS box was, um, uh, you know, it was minus forty outside, and it was running at about zero degrees ish. Wow, which is pretty cool. cool. So that was meant that we still had a lot of room because even though the the the, the, the processor could run at between minus forty and plus eighty five degrees centigrade, right. The um, lower the temperature you go, the more issues you have if you lose power and the system powers off and you have to restart it. Okay. Okay. Which is why in Canada, by the way, you typically when you are parking your car during winter, you have a cable that comes out of the car. You plug it into a wall socket in the parking spot. Okay. Which is then powers a heating element inside your engine to keep your engine warm while oh. you're parking your car outside so otherwise your car won't start yeah. Right. Incredible. so that was one extreme the other extreme was in the uh was in the desert in the united arab emirates because we oh, had the one extreme with, to yeah. with, uh, with with uh, with with heat yeah where inside the um inside the enclosure right the temperature inside was 70 degrees centigrade Okay, so no, what we're talking, I'm assuming. Damn hot, yeah. And so we had like the electronics running, typically sort of 75 between 75 and 80 degrees during oh. summer. Yeah. And uh, but you, you didn't have to do anything to cool it down, special. Not for sure. Uh, the, the enclosure was the was the, the heating element, uh, not heating like the radiator. Yeah, the only thing that we had to do was to make a kind of sunshade right so oh, okay. that, uh you know it the actual enclosure right the, the housing where the gateway system was installed wasn't in, in direct sunlight it's all sunlight, sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it, it, it held up pretty well so you know that's always the fun thing about doing field tests is you want to torture test right there's only so much you're going to learn from doing a laboratory test because mm -hmm. you can take a, an electronic board, you can take a finished product, you can go to a test lab and you can put it in an oven and heat it up. You can put it in a freezer and cool it down. You can either cycle it, you can do some very extreme temperature cycling, mm -hmm. and you could do um, what's known as a halt. 
HALT, okay. which is a highly accelerated life cycle test. Okay. So what you're doing is you're basically cycling it very quickly through um, uh, these extremes mm -hmm. because you want to be able to measure like sort of, you know, and approximate, well, if I'm doing it these amount of times in this amount of, you know, this interval, then over normal, you know, wear of use, I should get this lifespan. But that yeah. really isn't representative of what it's like in the, in the, in the real world. In the real world, you've got crazy stuff that happens. Right. No, but Matthew, like that, that was a very, very nice chat. I'm glad uh, we did it. So I learned a huge amount of cool information about mm -hmm. what you do, what your product is. Uh, I'm yep. seeing some boards in the background. Are you preparing something? Yeah, no, definitely. I'm busy building out some new, uh, some new boards for a new order that's coming up. I was busy getting ready to deploy uh, about seven new systems for a customer over the summer awesome perfect so thank you matthew and uh, thank you for everybody for watching this uh, i hope you learned something new uh, go out put your raspberry pies on on the sun or maybe in the uh, canadian tundra and uh, that's it okay <laughs> cool thank you. well thank you very much david for the chat it was really exciting thank you so much you're welcome. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. Yeah.